is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. Isn't that one of the most inspirational videos uh, you have ever seen? Actually, if you head to YouTube and, and type those words in, the most inspirational video you've ever seen, uh, this is the one that will come up. It is such a powerful, powerful story about hope. And, uh, and, I, and it almost moves me to tears each and every time that I see that story. Hope comes in, in a lot of different shapes and sizes, doesn't it? You know, we, we often hope that, uh, that the financial planning that we have done in order to prepare for our future um, is going to pay off later in life. Uh, you know, we, we hope that, that, that the next diet that we do, that's the one that's going to finally work uh, in, in order to help us. Or, or, or right now, we are hoping that the candidates that we voted for or, or the ones that we are about to vote for uh, this coming Tuesday uh, is going to be the one that is going to make a huge difference, a positive difference in our cities, right, and in our states and in our countries. Uh, for those of us who have the privilege, uh, the opportunities to go on vacation, what do we hope for oh we hope a lot of times we will even pray that the weather will be good don't we right and, you know I've, I've been praying that for this afternoon uh when for our trunk and trunk or treat that we have the opportunity to share that with everyone that the weather would be good but here's the challenge right a lot of the things that we put our hope in can fail us right people disappoint Circumstances change. And the next thing you know, we are struggling because the things that we have been holding on to, the things that we have been hoping will be solid in our lives, we all of a sudden realize that they aren't. And what do we do in that situation? How can we experience hope in a broken world? How in the world does Nick get to the point that he in that video just has hope for each and every day? Well, that's, that's where I'm heading in this message series. I, I want us to take some time and look through a letter that one of the apostles, Peter, wrote to people that were struggling with where they were. And, and how this letter that, that this fisherman writes to them was really one just to remind them that we do have hope. And today we're going to look at the basis of our hope, but, but then we're just going to each and every week we're going to continue on to a next section of First Peter. I actually encourage all of us uh, each and every week during this series, it's not super long, just, just open to First Peter and just read through the entire letter. And we will come each week and we will talk about the things that uh, Peter is trying to show people in regards to hope. Lord, would you help us as we begin to see the things that Peter wrote to people that were struggling. But to realize that this is a letter that's written to us as well. And God, I catch myself all the time holding on to things that aren't you. And so may I be reminded, as we all are reminded, of what we can grab onto for hope. May your spirit work in a mighty and powerful way wherever we are, God. And may the words that I share, the things that we all hear, be acceptable and pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. 
So, so let's jump in uh, to the beginning of this letter. And when we start that, it's, see that it's written by this guy named Peter. Back then, they would put the names at the start of the letters instead of the end of the letters to let people know who they were. And, and this one starts off by, by Peter saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And, and so this, who is this Peter guy? He is one of the 12 people that Jesus chose to be a, an, an apostle, chose to follow him. And, and after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, one of the things that he did is he went to Peter and he gave him a very specific task. And what that task was, was to feed and take care of my sheep. And so, so Jesus ascends into heaven, and now Peter has this responsibility. How do I feed and take care of my sheep? And, and so he begins to, to be somebody of key leadership for the early church as it began and as it expanded. And, and so people look to him um, for, to help them to know what are the things that God is calling us to do. You were there. You were with Jesus. And so what are the things that we can do? And, and in the midst of that, Peter writes this letter. Now it's, it's in the six, somewhere in the 60s AD. So it's about 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. Peter's writing this letter to these people that are scattered all over. But what he calls them is God's elect. It says, to God's elect. And we are about to get into the situation where theologians have battled for years on, on what this means. But, but what we know that the word elect here means is, is the people that have been chosen by God. And so we know that God has chosen these people, but for some reason they are now exiles, if you continue on in the verse, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, right? And, and so So what we get is this picture that God has chosen these people, but for some strange reason, they are now scattered throughout the world. And, and, and they are people that are in exile, which means that they are, they do, in a sense, do not have a home. And the picture that I put up on the screen here, if you were to look at where I am, if you were to take my nose, right, and start heading down south from there, this is where Peter, uh, this is where Israel is. And and the people that are mentioned in this are scattered throughout this entire area. Uh, this is this is Peter just kind of thinking of all the people that have been scattered from, from our original place and beyond. Uh, this would be modern-day Turkey and modern-day Greece uh, at the far left of the screen, right, at, and up on top, we, we get to some areas of Bulgaria. And, and, and so people now have been scattered throughout this. And in a sense, they do not have a home except the fact that they are God's chosen. They are God's elect people now in this area facing difficulty, dealing with people that believe that different gods are, are the gods as opposed to the one true God, you know, the, the God, the father. And, and so he continues on with with the with the letter to say, you who have been chosen, right? You who have been picked by God, selected by God. And then we start getting into the challenging language, according to the foreknowledge of God, the father. And and so we start to get this picture that, that God knew that this was going to happen. God knew that these people were going to be scattered abroad. God also knew that these were going to be people that were going to trust in him trust in god for for everything that that they believed in and and so so the question then becomes that that the theologians begin to battle with is is did god know that these people were going to say yes to him and 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 we who look at scripture and believe it to be true and where god is the same yesterday today and tomorrow right he is also the one who knows everything past present and future and so we know that god knew who these people were going to be we know that god was going to speak to his chosen ones who are scattered abroad which we now are a part of receiving this letter but the question becomes, because God knew it, did God choose those people? And the answer is, is we don't know for sure. Some people go on the line of, yes, God did choose pe- these people. And some people go on the line of, no, uh, God made the, the opportunity available, and, and they or we said yes. Either way, God knows who the people are that are trusting in him. And then this goes on to say that it's according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. 
Now, if you were here in our last message series where we talked about the Lord's Prayer, uh, we, we hammered uh, into, the fa- into us the fact that God being Father is, is a call to us to, to have a relationship with this intimate, loving God. Right? The one who, who knows that an intimate relationship with him is the best thing for our lives. It's the best thing for us for eternity. And so according to this one who loves us, who knows everything and loves us through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Now, now we have to just pause to say that we're beginning to see that the Trinity is involved in all this. That, that, there, are, that there are three persons, in a sense, to this one essence. And we know that the Spirit is doing some sanctifying work in, in our lives. And what does that mean? That means that the Spirit is working in each and every one of us, those who have given our lives to Christ, that the Spirit is working in every one of us to set us apart for holy living, right, and and faithful service. And so this is what the Spirit is doing in us. That's the sanctifying work. He is is working to make us more like Jesus, right, so that we can be people that, that each and every day are a little step closer to faithfully, holy living and following in the service that God has for each and every one of us. That's what the Spirit is doing. But the sanctifying work, the the connection to God the Father, only happens to those who are willing to be obedient to Jesus Christ, as the Scripture continues. Those who are are willing to surrender and trust and entrust God with, with Jesus our lives. But then it says, the spring, and sprinkled with his blood. And so now we see the full picture of the Trinity, that God the Father who knows and loves everything and desires this intimate relationship for us because that's what's best for us. His spirit, for those of us who have looked to him and have surrendered to him, believing in the shed blood and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the spirit is now working in our lives to help us to be faithful wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves scattered in this world, even if it's in difficult places where, where people don't believe the same things that we believe, people that, but won't trust that Jesus is the only way, God is working in us. And, and what Peter says in the midst of all of this is, here's his welcome. He says, grace, which is limitless love, grace and peace, be yours, be mine in abundance Right. And the word abundance here that, that it's increasing in us each and every day. That this just continues. We continue to understand and experience God's limitless love and his peace in our lives. And then he goes on and he just gets super excited, it seems, in the letter, where all of a sudden he just starts to say, praise be to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to him. And, 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 he, and in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. And let's stop right there. Because, because he, he says that we have this new birth, right? That we are brand new creatures because we have believed that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again. He shed his blood, his sacrifice is the one that saves us. Right. And and so now in his great mercy, we are new people because we believe that. And the spirit is working in us to 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 move us towards this life lived as Jesus would live it. But he gives us this birth into a living hope. Now, he doesn't just use the word hope. And, And so what is a living hope? I was thinking about it, and I just started to to come across some things that that I have or that we all have or have had to help us to understand what it means to to have a living hope. Let's say you're you're trying to convince your spouse, like like me, I'm trying to convince Kara to make her spaghetti, or you're trying to make somebody to make something for you, right? But with Kara and her spaghetti, here's what I know. A, she makes the best best spaghetti on the planet. Go ahead and ask her and, and, and force her to make some so that I can have some too, right? She has, she makes the best spaghetti on the planet, but there is a noticeable difference when, when she is trying to put it all together between taking something like this, where the herbs are dried and dead compared to fresh herbs. 
And for those of you who have cooked and those of you who understand, there is a significant difference between using something fresh and alive as opposed to using something that, that has been dead and dried. All of us probably somewhere in our house have something like this, right? Where we have a cell phone that uh, that just it doesn't work anymore. We have Verizon, and Verizon will not allow this phone to be used. I, I actually don't even know if this phone will turn on anymore. It, it's a dead phone. And, and you compare that with the phones that many of us use today, right, where it's alive, and we have the ability to, to take and use these things. And, and if we start plugging something in and we start punching some things in with our fingers, the expectation is, is that we are going to use this because the battery has been charged. It's alive. We are able to call somebody, which young people, this, these things are also used to call people, not just to text, not just to Snapchat, not just to Instagram, not just to TikTok, right? But we can actually use these things to call people. But the whole idea behind it is, is this is alive, right? And this is dead. It is no longer of use. And, and, and here's what here's what Peter, I think, is trying to help us to understand when he is talking about this new birth that we have, that we are now alive to, to, to this relationship with God uh, so that we can now experience this living hope, this hope that is actually alive and useful for our lives right now. How powerful is that, right? And the word hope means expectation okay so 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 we expect that something that is that that living herbs were used in order to cook is going to be so much better than something that is dead we expect that a phone that actually is on and alive is, is going to be able to do something for us where we do not expect this to do anything for us and so what peter is trying to help us to understand is that we have this living expectation. And we're going to be using the word hope through this entire series, right? He's writing this letter to try and bring hope to people, but it's an alive hope. We have this alive expectation that something significant, something different can happen today in my life, and, and something can happen tomorrow in my life, and that comes through the resurrection. This is what the scripture says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is what our hope is based on. And, and so what Peter is trying to tell the people who are scattered abroad, right? You're in difficult situations. You're around people that, 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 that don't know that Jesus is the one who makes a difference or don't care. Or you're stuck in difficult situations in your life. Our hope is alive, right? Our hope is 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 something that is living and it's an expectation that we know something can happen in our lives today because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? Peter's saying we have something for our lives. We can expect something today because Christ is alive. And because that we are alive for anything and everything that he has for us. Our hope is based on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then, and then he goes on to say, and, you know, that, that, we, that we have this hope in Christ and his resurrection, right? And into an inheritance, he says, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Well, let's just stop here and think about an inheritance. Because at the time, uh, people had the Old Testament as their memory. And so the idea, very, very clear, it seems likely to, to first century people, that, that when they would think of inheritance, uh, the, the, group, the Greek alludes to it, that they were looking back to some key uh, thing in their life. And what that key thing was is that the inheritance that people had was, was a portion, each tribe of the 12 tribes, you know, would receive this portion of the promised land. And so it was an actual physical place that they had this expectation was going to be theirs in their lives. Even though they're scattered abroad right now, there is an actual physical inheritance that you have, Peter tells them, 
But now this inheritance, what he says, is something that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And, and so, so what we have to picture now for us, what Peter's trying to tell us is there is a place. There is this actual physical place for you, for me, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And we think of these three words, and we think that they're all kind of similar. But there was three very, very different points that Peter was trying to make about this place that is ours. This inheritance that is ours, this physical, actual place. He says it's a place that it will not perish, which means that it won't decay, right? Uh, that that, that, that it, it will never be corrupted. And so that's the picture. Is, is This place, this physical place can never be corrupted. Nothing, nothing bad can happen to it, right? Uh, the word spoil here, it, it actually is what it's focusing on. The word means to, that it is wholly pure. And, and, and the image, the, this word is often used when it's talking about a marriage. And, and, and a husband and wife who comes to bed, to, comes together, their marriage bed is something that is to remain pure at all times. And, and so, so the picture is, is, is this couple that has become one and, and, and they choose to remain faithful to that no matter what goes on in life. And we all understand that the reality is, 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 is there are things in this world that try to come to distract our idea and our understanding that we have this thing that is wholly pure in our lives. Well, and, and, and so sometimes it's hard for us to understand that. We also realize that the enemy, Satan, is trying to get our life, this, this idea that we have this completely holy, pure thing that, that is before us, and, and it is a part of our future and a part of our life. He's trying to distract us from that. He's trying to get us to keep from being pure ourselves. And, and so, so it's the, something that is not, cannot be corrupted. It is something that is wholly pure. And then it says, or fade. And, and, the, and the Greek word here, the image that it represents is, is a picture. If you were able to picture this, close your eyes, if you, if you will, and just picture a flower, a beautiful, beautiful flower that will always remain alive and vibrant no matter what. This flower never loses its beauty. And so what Peter is trying to tell us, what he's trying to tell people is we have this actual inheritance. Nothing can corrupt it. It is wholly pure. And the beauty of this thing will never fade. Doesn't that sound extraordinary? It sounds like the, the absolute perfect thing. In, in the year 2000, um, since 2000, incredible advance, advancements have been made uh, in our country. You know, the, the, if you were to consider, I, you know, I've already shown you that my my Apple iPhone, or if you consider the iPhone, if you consider the uh, the, the Kindle that we now uh, many of us often use. Actually, actually, I need to plug this one in. Uh, but the Kindle that we that we use, that these things have made a huge, significant difference in our lives. Right, the the way that we communicate, the way that we organize our lives and information, it just has shifted right uh, for, for us uh, it, it has become very very possible that we can change and adjust and navigate our lives through technology and just by pushing a few buttons right we have this ability to do these things but there's um, some other key things that have happened since 2000 right we have this confidence that we have control over our lives and we can make determinations but since 2000, a couple of key things, a couple of significant events have happened that just cause us to remind ourselves that we might not actually be in control. I mean, you know, many of us remember 2001, right? When, when, when the Twin Towers came down because airplanes were being flown into them by terrorists, and as well as the Pentagon and another place, right? Some of us, we saw this on TV. And what happened to us? It caused us to realize that we don't necessarily have control over everything, right? 2008, the stock market plummets. And, and people that were depending on that and, and thinking about retirement, all of a sudden, their lives had to change, didn't they? I, I remember talking with my dad, who was thinking of retiring, and then all of a sudden, he couldn't because of how much money he lost when the stock market just dropped a taint. And all of a sudden, we realized maybe we don't have control over our lives like we thought we did. 
I, I think one of the third significant events that happens in our lives to help us realize that we aren't in control is happening right now. I mean, it's the reason that I'm at home. It's because that there's this, there's this virus that's out there and it is impacting people's lives. We do not have control over these things. Yet what Peter is trying to help us to understand is that we have something. Regardless of what goes on in this world, we have this inheritance, this actual place. Nothing can corrupt it. This thing is wholly pure, and it will never fade away. And this inheritance that goes on in verse 4 says, is kept in heaven for you. There's a place set aside for you and for me, those of us who have given our lives to Christ, to God's elect, right, that is in heaven. And, and here's what the place is. Here's the, what I believe the place is. Standing or kneeling or whatever in the presence of God Almighty. Nothing can change that. It will never perish, spoil, or fade. And Peter goes on to say, and the inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith we now are shielded presently by God's power. The, the, the picture of shield, is, it's a military term, and, 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 and the image that they, they show is, is soldiers standing next to a fortress protecting it. Nothing can get in to what God has set aside for us, being in his presence. Those of us who are of faith are shielded by God's power until, it says, the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So, so, so here's what Peter's trying to help people to understand. This faith that we have gives us this inheritance in heaven, the presence of God, and that is shielded. Nothing can change that. But while we are also here, that same shield is protecting us by God's power. Until the salvation, our salvation, our belief that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to be the sacrifice of our sins, we give ourselves to him, right? When that is finally revealed at the last time, and, the, and, and what it's talking about is that at some point, Jesus is going to come back again and take his followers to be in his presence. Our hope is secure for eternity. Nothing can change that. Peter's saying our, our, our hope is, is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus, and it is secure. Nothing it can change what God has given us and what God will give us in the future. So take heart is what, people is, uh, what Peter is saying. And then he goes on to just continue to talk. He said, in all this, you greatly rejoice. Right? And, and the word rejoice, it's a public praising, right? That, that we are people that are publicly praising out loud who God is. He, he said, he said, you, we, we rejoice that God, that Jesus has been, died and rose again, right? We rejoice that we have this inheritance. Nothing can change that. And that God's power is working in our life right now. He says, all this, we rejoice. We publicly say that we are thankful to God for what he has done in our lives. So though, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer some grief, all kinds of trials. And, and, and when I think about the grief and the trials that I experience, and I try to compare them with what other people are experiencing, sometimes I feel really good about myself. And, and, and sometimes I, I, you know, I feel like I'm incredibly blessed. And sometimes I feel like I'm not blessed. And some of you are in situations that are very, very different from mine. And my guess is you do the same thing. And when we ask ourselves, why, why, does, why is this happening? Why does this happen to me? And I don't necessarily know the answer, but, but I think Peter tries to help us to understand why these things happen. Why we get put in situations, which you may be in right now, where you feel like you're suffering grief. You're experiencing all kinds of trials. Peter says, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, so that the proven genuineness of your faith. Now, the word genuine here means character. 
we go through tough times so that our character can be proved. Now, the word proved here, it's, it's the same word that they use when they're talking about melting down, uh, uh, you know, metals to, to get rid of the bad stuff of the metal so you can have more pure metal when all's sudden done. And, and so in the difficult times in our lives, when the time when, when, when the stuff in us has to be removed that isn't necessarily living for Jesus, that we aren't trusting him in our lives, or things are difficult in the situations around us, it says that these things happen so that our character can be proved and more, can be character can be proved so that we can become more like Jesus. You've come so that you've proven genuineness, the proven character of your faith, that, that uh, our character Becoming more like Jesus, who we are, how we act, the way that we behave, that, he says, is of greater worth than gold, which perishes. Even though it's refined by fire, even though it seems like a tough element is what they're saying, even that will fade away. But you want to know it won't fade away, he says? The character that comes because of our faith. He said, the, the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, and glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And, and this is, again, talking about present and future. And so, so Jesus gets honor and glory and praise when he is revealed in and through our lives right now. No matter where we are, no matter the difficulties that we are in, when we, when we allow our character to be shaped by God, and, and that becomes vocalized as a part of our lives, the result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's what faith, that's, that's the result of faith. And then he shares these three things, these three extraordinary things about us. He says, though you have not seen him, Peter walked with Jesus, he was with Jesus, and now he's talking to people that haven't seen, haven't seen Jesus, right? Though you have not seen him, you love him. This is the agape, the, 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 the unlimited, the sacrificial love. Though, though you haven't seen him, you're willing to sacrifice for him, right? Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And this is the, this is the entrusting word where action takes place. You, you, so, so you, you love him, you're willing to serve him in any way, and you're willing to put into action your belief in him. And then the third thing he says, and, and when we do this, we are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Our lives show our faith in Christ. Our hope is displayed through the genuineness of faith. Why? Because we're on the receiving end of the results of our faith. It changes our character. It helps us to become more like Jesus. The salvation of our souls. This is the end result. But again, this is a present and a future thing. We are saved now. And our salvation becomes fully complete when we meet Jesus. And experience the inheritance that he has for us. Our hope is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? Our hope is secure for eternity. And our hope is displayed through the genuine faith that we have, we show our trust in Jesus Christ in and to the world around us. That's what Peter, is, just as he's starting a letter to us, to people who are scattered throughout the world, he wanted you to know, he wanted me to know that it's all about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our future is secure so we can live now in a way where our character, where we trust God's spirit to make our character become more and more like him. Isn't that amazing? And then I think of people like Nick, Nick Vujicic, who's the, who's the video that we just saw. How in the world does somebody like him experience hope? You saw uh, the remarkable story of him uh, being able to, to, to go and speak and teach to people. But, but where does his hope come from? Well, I'd love for you to, to watch this video to see. I was born in Melbourne, Australia, 1982. 
And my parents had no idea that I was going to be born without arms or legs. I was the only one that I ever saw without limbs. My faith in Jesus Christ was sealed after seven years of wondering why, God, I was born this way. Uh, he answered me very clearly through John chapter 9. And I gave my life to Jesus at 15 after reading about how he came across a man who was born blind. And I'm like, hey, hold on a second. This looks interesting. <laughs> and no one knew why he was born that way. I'm like, perfect. So I read on, and in verse 3 of the ninth chapter, Jesus said, It was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. And I'm like, wow, God, if you had a plan for the blind man, you do have a plan for me. And that was the beginning of my personal relationship with Jesus. Youth groups were starting to call me. Churches were starting to call me. Opportunities were opening up everywhere for me to share my testimony. I was speaking in front of 300 sophomore public high school students. Three minutes into it, half the girls were crying. One girl in the middle of the room started weeping. She put up her hand and she said, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but can I come up there and give you a hug? In front of everyone, she came and she hugged me. She cried on my shoulder and whispered in my ear, no one's ever told me that they love me. No one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. I couldn't believe it. It changed my life. That was when I knew I was called to be a worldwide evangelist. <laughs> broken pieces until you give God your broken pieces. Okay, thank you. And I want you to know when you fall down, God's grace is sufficient. God's hand will come down and pick you up. And give you the strength to get back up. By the grace of God, we have seen face to face a half a million souls say yes to Jesus and be plugged into a local church. As crazy as it sounds, our goal at Life Without Limbs Ministry is to preach to every single soul on the planet. Seven billion people. We believe that this goal is possible as the Holy Spirit is gathering an army and building up supporters to send us and accomplish this mission. Peter tells us that God is there. And because of Christ, we have hope. I don't know what your situation you're in, but I see a life like Nick's and I think, God, you can use me too. Lord, thank you for the challenge of your word. Thank you for the encouragement from Peter that our hope is based in you. That is such a gift. It's actually even a bit of a relief. God, now I, and, and, and I'm speaking for all of us, I hope we, God, are people that want to say, yes, we believe in Jesus. We trust our inheritance, God, and now we choose to live and show our life in this world. No matter what my situation is, God, I'm going to allow your spirit to work in and through me. Help us, God, to be people of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebentonchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.